36. See my, he's ever been to that? Can't believe it. You know, it's later than you think it is. Let the music play a minute or two. Live stream audience doesn't come in until about 11, most of them. Lift our hands to him. Just thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ray Foster's healing up. Mm hmm. Mm, thank you, Lord, that Don Schaefer's healing up. Praise the Lord in the house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory. Glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Glory in the house of the Lord. Glory in the homes of the saints. Glory in all the workplaces of the righteous. Glory in all the businesses of the saints. Blessing upon all the works of your hands. Amen. I speak blessing. Blessings to you in your mind, in your will, in your emotions. Blessings over your checkbook. Blessings over your savings accounts. 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 Blessings over this absentee row of front chairs in Jesus' name. I call souls to the front row. We did that uh, REACH event up here, and KCM rented all those chairs for the amphitheater. I think they rented 400 chairs, and Riley Stevenson came to help me with uh, outreach. And he said, Pastor John, every one of these chairs, I look at them, and I think they represent souls. I looked at Riley, and I said, I see fannies. <laughs> he just bust out laughing. That, too. That's the day he told me, he said, Pastor John, nobody does us like you do. <laughs> I said, oh well, praise the Lord. Well, let's just stand here in his presence a minute. <laughs> ah, he has something he might need to say, something he might need to do, something he might want to show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you should be a cocoa and get to get some room, like I said. Yeah, so good to come on and the book and the cookie suffering and book room, secretly on the back. Who got some of her market to take a supper? Mm hmm. She created the bar to serve her on the cook. Yeah. Yes, they will. Well. You're going to find out that your daughters are highly intelligent right there. I see her face, and because her IQ is going to be so high, uh, it's going to be, it'd be a, a tendency for her to want to talk about that. So you, when you find out her IQ is red, you keep the number to yourself for a while because she's over 150. <laughs> yeah. When did you read that? Oh, I read that a long time ago. I hear that conversation coming. 
I just say that the minds of the children of Church on the Word are absorbent like a sponge. And they're strong in their minds and knowledgeable of the Scripture and knowledgeable of things and instinctive about life's events. In the name of the Lord Jesus. All right. We want to welcome our live stream audience in here at 11 o'clock. God bless you all. Thank you from wheresoever you have tuned in. We're here at Church on the Word this morning. We're in the middle of a Sunday morning worship service and we're about to teach the Word. And in the last few uh, weeks we've been talking about, the Lord began to share with me a subject of posturing, that birth is a posture, and that uh, infancy is a posture, and, and then uh, sitting up is a posture. Remember the first time your baby crawled over, rolled over? Remember when that happened? And, uh, and uh, the phone calls started calling all over the place. Oh, he rolled over today. He rolled over. He rolled over today. And... Uh, um, and then he sat up for the first time. Oh, here come the phone calls again. He sat up. This time he pulled up, pulled up, pulled up, and stood up is a posture, isn't it? Then walking is a posture. Then falling is a posture. Stumbling is a posture. Getting back up is a posture. Sleeping is a posture, isn't it? Laughing is a posture. Rising up in the morning is a posture. Running is a posture. Walking. He began to share with me things about how that spiritual posturing is just like natural posturing. There are people that get up and they go and then they stumble and then they fall. And he, you know how many times the Bible says the righteous man will stumble? Seven times the righteous will stumble, which is indicating it's a type of multiple times. But the Lord lifts him up. I like it when I stumble and fall and the Lord pick me up and brush me off and pat me on the fan and get me back on my, get me on my way. Amen. I needed to know he was there. Next time you stumble, you know he's right there. The Bible says that who are we that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. He shall be holding up. The Bible says God's able to make him stand. Amen. So we got to talking about spiritual posturing in the last few weeks. And we were talking about, during the baby dedication service here, we were talking about that one of the postures that the Lord teaches us is in Deuteronomy 11. He said, fill your heart with his, with your, with his words and teach them to your children. He didn't say send them to Sunday school and let the Sunday school teach them and then you just do whatever you want to do when you're at home and tell them to get out in front of the television. He said, he said, teach them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down and when you're getting up. Now, I'm either in my house walking by the way, lay, laying down or getting up, aren't you? In other words, teach them all the time. Teach them. When you're laying down, who in here can tell me your children have not let you go to bed? You go to lay down and they're all up in the, your business with you. And when you get up in the morning, they're still in your business. And when you're walking by the way, they're right there with you. And when you're sitting in your house there, all, you, can't hard, you can't hardly do anything without them being right there. Well, he said, get my words in your heart and you teach them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, when you're getting up. And these four postures above tell us to teach our kids by spending much time with them. Put something in your heart, have something to say, and then teach it to your children. Amen. Then we got to talking about, well, the Lord said, there's also posture in the house of God. And last week, it was the most unusual of messages. Who in here remembers last week's message? Was that unusual? In Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7, he said, when you enter the house of the Lord, keep your foot there. That's one of the postures. And then be more ready to hear than speak like a fool. Number two is be ready to hear. Number one is keep your foot there. Number two is be ready to hear. Number three is be slow to speak. Number four is pay what you vow. Don't vow. If you're not going to pay, it's better not to vow than to, 
vow and not pay. Then he says, check your flesh at the door. Who in here has got any problems in your life? Any problems at all? It's all right. Let's not get it. Okay. Check all those at the door. Enter the house of the Lord and prepare to worship. And don't just dump your load of problems on your fellow brother and sister in church every Sunday. They don't come here to listen to your problems. The Lord is waiting for you to tell Him. See? We don't want to come here and afflict the comforted. We want to comfort the afflicted. <laughs> so you check your flesh at the door. Then don't let the angel that's here hear you say your excuse for why you did what you did or whatever happened. Don't let him hear it because the scripture says, why, if the angel hears that, knowing that you're... See, pride, this is worth writing in your notes, pride seeks to justify itself. Humility never has any excuse. And the reason why that's so important is because pride always precedes a fall. But before honor and promotion is humility. Amen. So don't let the angel hear that. Why would God then want to start just destroying things in your life? And number seven. Some people ask me, I didn't get number seven last week, Pastor. Fear thou God. When you come to church, come and fear the Lord. Reverence His presence. That's uh, number four. Pay what you vow. You always want to promote by honoring God with the first fruits of your substance. It sure did work for us, didn't it, Mama? So now, this morning, in the time we have remaining, I want to share with you something that has, I've been thinking about for weeks, and I thought, well, Lord, I have talked about this. But this is part of posture. Did you ever find that image of that little animal I was telling you about, Lance, on Google Images? See if you can find that. Somebody say, thank God for the word of the Lord. You know, I didn't know any of this when I was 19 years old. I didn't even know how to quote John 3.16. Can you imagine 19 years old and don't even know a Bible verse? Tragic, isn't it? So he did a quick work in me. I got born again the same Sunday that Jim Jones killed his congregation in French Guyana. Same weekend. That's when I made a public profession of my faith. The following Tuesday, I was at work and Jack Cromer met me, heard me talking in the break room. I guess I was talking, so I was excited. I felt good and was telling about, about the Lord, what he'd done Sunday. And he said, uh, he said to me out by the, the truck we were unloading, he, he asked my brother-in-law, can I unload with him? I want to talk to him. So he went in and worked with me. He said, I've got um, some, something I want to give you after work. We worked from 7.30 at night to 4 in the morning. So at 4.15 or so, we were out there, and he gave me some study helps and a set of tapes, the first basic believer's Bible course, 12 tapes by Kenneth Copeland. I got in those tapes that day. We were living in a little mobile home in Mableton. I was in those tapes by Wednesday. By Friday, I laid my hands on my mother. And I learned scripture. What are y'all looking at? Oh, there he is. There's another picture or two of him. He's holding on there. Look at another one. See if you find another one. You can go out on a, the, some of the places uh, like the zoos or whatever that, that have these animals. will have them out on a, a place where they can play and they've got their natural habitat. And then they've got concrete where the sun bakes. And if there's concrete, honey, they all go to bed. Watch. See if you can find, sun, find one. That's a sloth. Have you ever been to, uh, where was it at, at, uh, in uh, Universal Studios? or where, where were we where we went to that, that first show that called The Sloths at the DMV? 
at Disney. They did a little cartoon called The Sloths at the DMV, and they talk real slow like they do at the DMV when you're trying to get your license renewed. Yeah, utopia. All right, you'll find them. It's, those, those all look pretty active. Most of about 11 to 12 hours a day, they spend laying flat of their back with their arms just like this and their legs spread like that. And son, they are sleeping. Once in a while, you'll see them. You just look at them, they don't move. It's in their nature. They are sloths. It's in their nature. Wouldn't it be a peaceful life to be a sloth? I want us to read some scripture today. Let's look in the book of Proverbs for a little while. Y'all ready to uh, look through scripture? Can y'all help me preach this morning? I want y'all to read for me. And I'll uh, direct scripture and let's see what the Lord has to say to us this morning. Amen. Before I preach anything, let me just share with you that I was raised up in a house where my dad worked at Ford Motor Company. He came in every day. And um, there was not a lot taught about diligence in my home. Um, We sat around and watched the house mildew. We watched the grass grow. We waited until the leaves and the pine needles were so thick, we had to do something about it. So I had to light a fire under my own rear end when I got older. Now, one thing that helped was I started dating her. She'll rub something that ain't even dirty. Good at rubbing it down. That's Jane, that's clean right there, honey. <laughs> I want to talk to you about posture. We've talked about posture with kids, posture in the church, because there's a certain posture. If you're invited to the White House, are you going to walk through the halls and do as you please, or is there a certain protocol and posture you're going to? It'd be expected to follow. Protocol. You're going to dress a certain way. You're going to enter a certain way. You're going to address people a certain way. In fact, they're going to preempt you if you get the chance to meet the president. There's always several people before you that's going to get your name and address. You've already been frisked, believe me. And they'll get your information, then they'll come up and the president will have the card. Oh, Mr. and Ms. Alexander, pleasure to meet you. And you'll get the privilege of all of about 30 seconds with him, and you move on. There's a posture in every place. And it's not the law of posturing. It's called, I'll call it the instinct that should be in you concerning posture in every area. Now, this is a posture at home and a posture in our personal life that he's been dealing with me about. Let's go to Proverbs, and let's begin with uh, Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24. And once these scriptures are up on the, Lance has got the list of the scriptures. Once they're up, we'll just read them one time, one in the next, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit. Um, there is a difference between slothfulness and diligence. Someone say amen. amen. Slothfulness is reluctance, reluctance to work or to make an effort or is laziness. Diligence is having or showing care and conscientiousness in one's work or duties. Where are those proverbs? Let's see, let's see if we can get these up. 12.24. Did I look it up wrong? Wait, no, I'm, I'm looking. See, my, my wife's going to tell me there wasn't no scripture that says Proverbs 12.24. <laughs> Yeah, you, 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 I have to get it in the right book, too. 
I remember one time I was just preaching along, told everybody to go to Matthew chapter 12, and what I needed was Mark 12, and I was reading Mark 12, and they were all in Matthew 12, and I just kept on reading it like I was right. <laughs> it's amazing how it, 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 it still works. I just had to adjust it. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Look at verse 27. Y'all get ready to click these pretty quick. The slothful man roasts not that which he took in hunting. Now, he liked to go hunting, but now you, you, who, can, who can tell me that you, as soon as you kill an animal, you've got work to do. First of all, he's, what does he weigh? What, what was an average deer going to weigh, Larry? If he's 100 pounds and you're miles into the woods, oh my goodness, we got to get the winch tied to his antlers and get him drug up onto the truck and then get him to a certain place and get him gutted and field dressed before we can get him to the place to put him on ice. It's a lot of work. And then you got to, Prepare the meat to eat it. It's been fun up until then. The slothful man roasts not that which he took in hunting. But the substance of a diligent man is precious. A diligent man will get that thing killed, get him field dressed, get him work, get him back in the truck, brag about it, hold up the antlers, be working on the, on getting the meat all just cut up and, and, and then talk about it and share it and... Go back out and hunt again. He's diligent, isn't he? Somebody, yes, he is. Say yes. Yes. Proverbs 15 and verse 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. It's, what Solomon's talking about there is that just, just physically, a man that's lazy, just his pathway gets overgrown with briars. And, and I got to think about that while I was running my... I used my mower as a bush hog this week. I've got an old dull blade on it. And so I just went ahead and ran through. I thought, oh, I don't know if there's any. I mean, I mean, briars like you would not believe. It's been driving me nuts. I had that thing up on high all the way. had the engine cranking. And I set the blade and I went into that thicket. It went on through it. And I got back around, drove back around again. I drove back over again and cut about another six inches and drove across it again and turned back around and got another six inches and it hit a rock. Boom! Oh, I ain't go there again. Go back around, got another six inches around that rock and finally got it cleaned out. And I thought, I want to walk here, but I cannot. Boy, if I showed you my legs right now, of course I'm not going to. But if I did, I've got briar scratches all over them. Back up that first scripture, that, that Proverbs 15, 19. Y'all listen to this. But the way of the righteous is made plain. Now he's not just talking about a physical field. He's talking about our posture, our pathway. Our pathway of our life gets more and more hard to walk the lazier we become. Problems are exacerbated. They're added to there are problems that are added to just being. To see, and every one of us are called to be diligent. Every one of us. The scripture says there is a word called um, um, that means vocation. It is a, the word vocation means a calling. If something is, uh, have you ever noticed something needs done, it'll call to you? How dirty is that bathroom got to get before it screams at you? It'll call to you. It'll keep calling to you. I need to do that. I need to do that. You need to do that. Come and fix me. Come and clean me. Come and fix this. Come and fix this. Come and fix So finally, get the mower running and start fixing it because it's calling to me. I'm tired of that thing talking to me. Vocation is called a calling. It's the original word that means a calling. Now, the slothful man, his way is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Did you know that problems will come in if you're, if you're slothful and you won't know what to do? But the way of the righteous, the diligent man, it's very clear what he needs to do. Because he's diligent. He'll be able to see clearly. Next, next uh, verse. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. That's nasty. 
Next verse. A slothful man hides his hand in his bosom. Puts his hands in his pockets. Have you ever, oh, honey. Have you ever been on a job site? Those of you that have ever been contractors and see a guy there with his hands in his pockets. A good, have you seen it happen? A good um, contractor will come, get your hands out of your pockets, boy. Do you, so you want a job here or not? Yes, sir. Who's ever had you yelled at because you had your hands in your pockets? <laughs> I have. It says, hold on, going back. Go back. Hides his hand in his pockets. He'll not so much as bring it to his mouth again. It just grieves him to even have to lift his arms to feed himself. Next, next, next verse. The desire of the slothful kills him. Doesn't mean he doesn't have desire for things. Some people see somebody that's slothful or lazy say he just really doesn't want to do anything. Yeah, he, he wants he wants things. He just is not willing to go to any effort for it. His hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all the day long. His covetousness still speaks to him. But the righteous gives and spares not. The slothful man in verse 13, 22, 13 says, There's a line out there. I'll be slain in the streets. There's got to be some major danger why I can't get out and do it today. Oh, there's a line out there. Uh, you know, if I get out there, I mean, I could get killed. There's always some major reason why he cannot put his hand to the work. Next verse. Now, this one right here particularly speaks to me because it spoke to me since the day we were right here in this building. I kept reading this scripture some years ago over and over and over and over. I kept saying, why am I reading this? It says, I, Solomon said, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. No, go back again. I'm sorry. Scroll to verse 31. He said, I went by the field of the slothful and the, the, the vineyard of the man void of understanding. No, no, no. Let's go back. Read it out loud, Jane Lynn. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. The stone wall thereof was broken down. And what did he say happened? Next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Then I saw and considered it well. I saw and considered it well. I looked at it and received instruction. What did he say was the instruction? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. I never met a traveling, rambling uh, uh, drifter that wasn't broke. Have you? Never. They drop by this place all the time. Yeah. We're just on our way to Mississippi. Yeah. What's in Mississippi? Hunting it, whatever it is. Yeah. And I want as an armed man. Well, I kept reading that over and over again, over and over again. I thought, why I keep reading this? And one day I was out here and just drove around the property. And down here towards the end, the grass had grown up at the corner of the property. And there is a, there's a driveway down here. And that little rock wall is only about knee high. And it had some cat blocks on top that were knocked off and were laying on the sidewalk. And I looked at the grass standing up over it. And I thought, well, there's that scripture in Pro so I went home and got my weed eater and went down here and started cleaning up. In a minute I heard, hey, bro, Hank. He said, I've been meaning to get that. I'll help you. And he went over there and he started picking up those blocks and setting them up on that, that little walkway. He helped me clean it all up. And I said, Hank, this is, uh, this is scripture right here. I went by the field of the slothful. And I thought, decided right there, Solomon's telling me, I am the slothful. This is my field. The stone wall there was broken down. Nettles had covered the face of it. I'm not doing that again. So I did like any good, hardworking, diligent man would do. And I found Danny Harper, and he's been cutting the grass ever since. <laughs> yes, praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Next verse.
Now you found it. Okay, that's all of that one. What's the next one? Am I boring you? No, Proverbs 26, 13. The slothful man says there's a line in the way. A line is in the streets. Verse 14. And as the door turns on its hinges, so does the slothful on his bed. Now, let's just examine it for a minute. When a door is shut in your house, how long does it stay shut at night? All night. Next morning you get up and you open it up and it'll stay. Now, it never turns loose from its hinges. It'll just stay right there. It'll stay open. Then you turn it a little bit like this. Then you pull it two. You know, you put, pull a door two, but you don't close it. So it's pulled two for a while. Then it opens back up again. And it'll stay right there for hours. Some people turn over, and then they'll lay right there. Then sometime later, they'll turn a little bit more, and then lay right there. You ever heard of the term sofa surfer? That's the fellow that goes from one house to the next to the next person to let them sleep on their sofa because they can't really find a job, but they need a place in and out of the rain. They just surf in sofas. Say, sofa surfer, say it. <laughs> the slothful man hides his hand in his bosom, grieves him to bring it to his mouth again. The sluggard, same guy, is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Well, I'll tell you, I have met some of the wisest, talking, lazy, slothful, sluggard people I've ever met in my life. Just, I mean, just, you just would not believe how they can talk because they've had a lot of time to think about it. They hadn't had anything to do. Go to the ant, you sluggard. That's the only place in the Bible that the ant is mentioned. Consider her ways and be wise. No, 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 no. Next, go back. I'm sorry. We should have got this together. Uh, verse 7. Which having no guide. Now, this is an ant that has no guide, no overseer, no general contractor telling him to. Do you realize that today, once again, it's my fault. I should have done this. The sign out front says, surprise vis visit by Bishop Donnie Williams. And I had people walk up, Carol, is Bishop here again? No, Pastor John did not say, take the sign down. Take sign down, put sign up. Take sign down, put sign. I didn't say it. And Janie gets on me all the time. You tell everybody everything to do. The moment I don't, it don't get done. <laughs> Which having no guide or overseer or ruler provides her meat in the summer, the ant does, and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep, old sluggard? When are you going like, to wake up? When are you going to get out of your sleep? It's mighty quiet in here today. Go to verse 11. So shall thy poverty come as one that travels in thy want, as an armed man. Let's go to Proverbs 10 and verse 26. As vinegar is to the teeth, and smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard to them that send him. As soon as you send the sluggard, he, something's got to be done. It will not get done. We all know these people, don't we? Say it, Pastor. I ain't that guy. <laughs> all right. Proverbs thir uh, 13 and verse 4. Look at this. The soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 20 and verse 4. The sluggard will not plow. It's too cold to go out there and plow today. Ground's too hard. Some reason. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. See, if you're waiting on God to rain blessing out of heaven, listen, he will bless the work of your hands. He won't bless the... Somebody said, well, you know, I, I was going to get that job, but I just didn't feel led to take that job. I had a guy tell me this years ago. That's probably in the 80s. I didn't feel led to take that job. 
And the word of the Lord came to me. He said, yes, he did. He felt led. I said, he did? Said, yeah, in the seat of his pants. I feel led in my britches. All right, here we go. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. There it is again. My goodness. Say my goodness. My goodness. Romans chapter 12 and verse 11 gives you, this, gives you a statement. Paul said this. Be diligent in business. God will bless the work of your hands. It is a posture. I was raised up in my uh, late, uh, my early, I guess, teen years till I moved out and got married in a mobile home that was 12 feet wide and 60 feet long. I remember at one end of the mobile home, I put up a piece of board that made it look like a pitcher's mound, and I marked a, a plate 60 feet away at the other end because I knew I could measure the length of space from the pitcher's mound to home plate, I used the length of our mobile home. One time I missed, and it bounced off that mobile home. Mama let me know. Well, one day there was a man that worked there that lived in the mobile home park that worked a job. He came home. My dad ran a little store there. And he was just so down. He said he just got fired from his job. They laid him off, and a bunch of people were off of work, and he was just so distraught. And he could, he, he was, I'd never, I'd, his depression is what he was dealing with. And he went up to his house and lay down and went to bed for about three or four days. Finally, he came out of that trailer, slammed the door. He was mad, and he reached up under his mobile home and started cleaning out everything. Just stuff had been out. And, you know, materials and junk. We live in a mobile home park, and they always told us to, if you put a mobile home here, you got to put underpinning under it, and most people didn't. And the tires that t on home on wheels. If that's you, God love you. He started cleaning all that out and cleaning it out and cleaning it out and digging, get clean. I mean, raking. He got. He said, "I just can't sit here any, anymore." He's kept digging and cleaned all that and started cutting his grass. It had never been really cut all that good all these years. He cleaned and cleaned and cleaned and he went to washing the mobile home down and scraping the tongue of the trailer and repainting the tongue. And before long, other people were watching him. They said, oh, "Who cut your grass?" He said, "I did it." Will you cut mine? He started cutting grass for everybody in the mobile home park. Started cleaning, and doing repairs and maintenance. Within the next six years, he bought the mobile home park and has become wealthy. What did he do, Pastor? Got off of it and went to work. In this same mobile home park I'm telling you about today, there was a little kid there that we called Buddy. Buddy had white hair. And it grew, it looked like, it looked, looked fake. Daddy called him Cotton Top. And that's what it looked like, little rolls of cotton. And he had a little deep voice like this. You ever remember Froggy on the, uh, the Little Rascals? He talked like that. Froggy, he had a little froggy voice. And he talked all the time. Busy and busy, always in everybody's business. His, his dad was a roaring, screaming drunk. His dad had dropped his brother when he was a little boy and busted his head open. He was, wasn't all there. Bad news. Well, when he moved out of that mobile home park, he was 14 when he left. He told me he got his girlfriend pregnant. He quit school, and he went to work at the local Dairy Queen over here on Austell Road. Then he got a job at a Burger King at a different shift, and he rode his bicycle from the Dairy Queen on the morning shift. He got done and rode the bicycle down, sometimes in the pouring down rain, to the Burger King, and he worked both full-time jobs and took care of the baby and took care of the little girl. And one day, when he was 16 years old, he met a man who was driving a wrecker. And he saw how he could work with him. He got him, he, was the guy, he would jump out of the truck with the guy and he'd hook the hook to the car and the guy would pull it up, and they'd haul it where they were going. But he did all the, the, the junk work. He said he'd work about two weeks to make a bunch of money, and then he'd quit. I said, why don't you do this? If you make this kind of money, do it all the time. 
He said, oh, I can't do all this all the time. He got to thinking at 16. He got to looking in. The, we used to have this thing called the, uh, the, what was that little advertising page? Not Auto Trader. It was called uh, the Atlanta Advertiser. It didn't have pictures. He found a wrecker, 1960-something wrecker for $1,000. And he went and found it and looked at it and saw what it was. And he went to the bank and went with his uncle. And they went to the bank to see about borrowing $1,000 to buy that record. He said, if I can just buy this record, I can work during the day at the Dairy Queen. And I can do that at night. And he went in and applied for the uh, loan. And when they came in to talk to him, he sat down and he said to him, he says, son, I, I can't give you the loan today. He said, and it, just like a like a hot knife just stuck in me. He said, I just got up and got ready to walk out. He said, I was about to cry. And he said, son, come here, sit down a minute, sit down. He said, this could cost me my job, but I'm going to give you the $1,000 myself. And I'm going to guarantee the loan myself. It's against company policy to do this, but I'm going to do this for you because I believe you'll make these payments. He said, I'm about ready to cry. I couldn't hardly believe he's going to do it for me. He gave me the $1,000. My uncle signed with me. He said, I went and bought that wrecker. He said, I got it home. He said, and it needed uh, valve cover gaskets and it needed a oil sending unit and it's leaking oil. He said, I got it all cleaned up and got it. All. He said, I scrubbed and scrubbed and cleaned and scrubbed on that thing until every dent shined, every speck of rust looked good. He said, the wheels and tires were perfect. And he said, I went to work. He said, and 30 days later, he calls me, he still calls me Johnny from the days of the mobile home park with his voice, Johnny, 30 days later, I went and gave that man that $1,000 plus $76 for interest 30 days later. He said, and I went in business. Let me tell you where Buddy is today. He's retired on the beach, mid-50s. He's a multimillionaire. <laughs> he got up and went to work, had 12 records, 12 Jennies. It's a household name. <laughs> He, he wound up buying and selling classic cars, opened a little car lot, one thing after another. Watched, I watched God bless the work of that man's hands. But the thing is, he worked. He worked hard. And he got in a little bit of a riff with me one day years ago when I told him, I said, it's been good to see the Lord's good hand of blessing on you. He got mad at me because he was still in that kind of words. He did it, you know. Oh, you know, everybody that's a diligent man will think every once in a while it's, it's up to him. It is up to you. You got to work hard, but the phone don't have to ring. That's his part. Our part, it is, it is a shame for God to bring a blessing to you and you do nothing with it. It's a travesty for that phone to ring and then you don't service the customer. My goodness. Brother of him that's a great waster. Don't be slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Notice he says the serving of the Lord is directly connected to, to not being slothful in business. It's being diligent. Diligence is part of the serving. You're not going to be a real good serving the Lord Christian while you're laying on your butt half asleep all the time. Amen. Doesn't the Bible say that God will bless the work of your hands? Let me give you a couple of examples. There's one right over yonder. Just wave. Wave. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Yes, wave. Yes, I am. Talking about you. Wave. Look. There are diligent hands right there. She's in the service-oriented business. And thank God for chiropractors and people that know how to get you straightened back out. She's also got blessed elbows. I thought they were a curse. When my neck and back was, I thought I was in tears. And she popped something with her elbow. And my, I've been a good boy ever since. Yes, praise the Lord. I've watched her. Now, this one, this is just one right here. This is one example. She was almost, any harder hit, it might would have killed her in a car wreck she was in. She don't no more get healed up, and she goes back to work. And the work of her hands is very, very hard work. There's another one right there. There she is. If she looks at me, she'll know I'm pointing at her. Her right there. Hadn't she worked this week and last week? Watch her get her hand, get busy, put her hand to work. Why? Because you're going to have to have something to eat here before long, right? That's the way it works. Now, 
Here's another one right here. Her Christmas lights are still up in the summer because of what she did with her hands in the winter. I could just go on and on and on. Let all the tithers at Church on the Word wave at me. There you go. Let me tell you something, what I've learned about. Let me tell you the other end of this. I've been in ministry long enough now that I've got horror stories to tell you and stories of great victory. One such horror story happened here some years ago when uh, I was at, we were at a little storefront over here on Fairburn Road and uh, I had my uh, cordless phone. I was dealing with somebody and I walked outside just for the privacy and was talking when the car pulled in on two wheels and came up and stopped and this girl jumped out squalling, hollering, squalling so bad. I, I said, hold, 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 on, hold on just a second. And I set the phone on that that thing held all the um, mailboxes, sent up the big mailbox. She was squalling, shaking. I thought one of the girls had been killed. She had twin daughters. I thought one of them had been killed. I thought, my God, what could this be? And then while she couldn't talk, I was asking the Lord, but I, I got okay in here. I thought, this is not as bad, but I still had an alarm in me. She'd been thrown out of her mobile home park. They said, if you don't get out within 30 days, we're going to move the, the mobile home. So I said, well, come on in. Let's see. And she said, I'm out of a job. And so we got in. We got to talking. I found out that she needed uh, four different things and a job. So I made a phone call and landed her a $500 a week job before that day was out. That was bring home pay, which she took. I said, bring your bills in here to me because I had learned from Brother Pruitt, who is here today. I saw him years ago take a young couple in his office. This is what he did. All right, give me your checkbook, give me your credit cards, give me everything, bring your check to me. I'll run all your addition and subtraction for you. He said, if you'll leave it alone now six months, all your bills will be paid and you'll have more money in the bank you ever had in your life. So they would submit to him. One couple called and said, yeah, we just need $10 of our money. He said, go get your part-time job. I like how he handled them. You need some money? Go get you another job. Well, he'd hand it all back to them after they got it all straightened out because it's a matter of both hard work and diligence and seeing two things and watching the, every penny. Well, we're talking posturing here today. That's what I'm talking about. You got it? Okay. Now, this particular girl came in and uh, I said, uh, she gave me a list of the bills. I remember $3,187 and I told her about tithing. Here's your job. Here's your tithe. Here's the way we're going to set this budget up. And then she pointed at these, these back bills. So what about all this right here? I said, well, honey, I'm not a bank, but I will show you how we can start carving this. Now, I could tell she got a little bit aggravated. Well, after that, within about, I guess, five or six weeks later, she had the job and she was coming right along. But I started noticing walls going up between me and people that I knew that I was pastoring. Folks I'd known for your walls going up were just the, like just a coolness. They were just the warmth was not between me and, the, and my friendships with the people in the church. And so, come to find out, she was going and telling all the people that the walls were going up that Pastor John won't help me. And so one, she was tapping one for $125 a, a week for groceries, another one for $400 a week for lot rent, another one for clothes for the girls. She was using, she was, she was like a, and tapping into all the people of the church was her resource. And then she called me a child molester. Oh, I remember the day that me, me and my elder and my worship leader had to sit down in the office and Janie stuck her finger in her face and told her, you are not going to do this in this church. And I looked and I said, I am completely nauseated. The accusations that came about me, uh, 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 I, I got up and I left. I went to Longhorn. I don't know why, it was just the first place I could think. Got me some ice water and wondered what was going on. At night, I laid in bed and I started, from my gut, I started squalling and crying. I just had, could not fight the tears. I just thought, what am I crying about? What am I crying about? I cried till five in the morning and boom, went sound asleep. And boom, one hour later, I woke up. 
And the word of the Lord came to me. Proverbs 30, verse 15. I didn't have my Bible. I had left it in the office that day. I got up at 6 o'clock and drove straight to the office and got my Bible and looked at Proverbs 30 and verse 15. A horse leech has two daughters. She had twins, pretty girls, crying, give, 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 give. Back in those days, I used to do a monthly expose of the money here at Church on the Word. And uh, she accused me that day. I kept seeing all that money and running through this church, not one dime of it going to my girls. So she was tapping into all the people in the congregation, and they were all against Pastor John because these pretty little girls, and he wasn't helping nobody. Yeah, there are three things that are never satisfied. Four say it's not enough. Well, I come to find out, not only had she tapped into one for $125 a week, one for $400 a month, she got another girl that had been a longtime friend of mine to stroke a check for $7,600 and pay her trailer off and give it to her. Oh, she's pretty good. Professional. So that spirit run through this church. See, I used to be harmless as a dove and not wise as a serpent. Now I'm both. That'll teach you. So listen, let me just say this to y'all here. While you're being diligent and your profiting is appearing to all, be watchful. You know what a horse leech is? It is the, uh, it's a little insect about the size of an average man's thumb that does not attach to a dog, a cow, or anything. There's something about the blood of a horse. That when, they, that when equestrian owners will tell you if they go through like a swampy area, they have to check their horse diligently for these horse leeches because, the, was it, y'all, who, are you, who was the horse per person in here? Who, who, you know about these things. If a horse leech tax, attaches itself to the body of a horse, in 48 hours it'll drain its blood completely out of him. It'll just suck blood and excrete blood. It's like a pet cock. It'll drive into it and open up and it start and they found their horses laying in a pool of blood in their stalls. This is what this spirit was. It was a horse leech spirit that had come into church on the Word. I didn't have any pastor ever tell me this. I, this is not in the manual. They didn't teach me that at New Life Bible College. This is called the School of Hard Knocks. And then I had to go to each one of those couples and tell, listen, the next time you get tapped... You got to come to do, do. Do I have to tell you? Do you have? Do you? I was shocked that I had people that believed the lie. Do you think I wasn't willing to help her? So uh, one of my deacons at the time came to me, and after she left, she came back a couple weeks later. Well, I guess so. She needs some. Needs something else. He just walked out to her and said, look, uh, Pastor John's just not your pastor, and this is not your church, so why don't you just go ahead and find the church you need to go to. Fast forward 10 years later. I got a call in my office. It wasn't 10 years later. It's been in this building. And there was a former uh, real estate owner whose wife and he are in ministry too, and she called to tell me, Pastor John, do y'all help people down at your church? I said, yes, ma'am, we do. Oh, we've got this girl in our church that has been real diligent to help us here in this church. And she's done things to help us do things. And she's got two daughters. And I knew immediately who she was talking about. It just this, And she, she just needs help. I mean, she needs help with her car. She needs help with her groceries. She needs help with her utilities are behind. And we're doing all we can to help her. And quite frankly, everybody in the church is really... We're just, there's only so much we can do. I knew who she was talking about. I said, is her name? And I said her name. I said, hello. Yes, I, do you know her? I said, yes, yeah, just your turn. Now, from time to time, we're all going to have needs here. And we're all going to see to the needs of everybody that is here, aren't we? We are, we are diligent to, to watch our own, don't we? But remember, you can have a horse leech spirit sucking the blood out of you before you know it in the name of Christian help. When really all you need to do is get up off your butt and go to work.
Thank you for joining us today for the Word Wise Christian broadcast here at Church on the Word. Remember, God gave us His uh, written Word to get our thinking straightened down. When His mindset becomes our own, peace is always the result. Our believing, our confession gets straightened out. We get straightened out because we have just become Word, word Wise. God bless you. <laughs> See you next week. Look, y'all. Look, you listen, you listen to me as we're closing up. Thank you, sir. Coming from you, that means a lot. Oh, yeah, I left my illustrated sermon. When that old boy lost his job and lived in that mobile home park, and he was distraught. He went cleaning. He went to fixing. Hey, listen, ain't nobody in here that is so, invul so invalid you can't do something with your hands. God will go as far as you. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. There's something you can do. Didn't you love to watch Jerry Watkins while he was with us? That was the most diligent, hard-working man I've ever seen. And he did, you didn't even know that wheelchair was an, an impedance. And if he wasn't working on his job, he was doing professional photography. Busy. Get out there and I'd watch him when he dropped that ramp down. It's pouring down rain. He, he never ever complained about his plight. He could, have, he could have gone into depression. He was always working with his hands. Yeah, he did. He told me one day, he said, I'm thinking about marrying this girl. He said, I want to marry. He talked about it. And when he brought Marsha here, I thought, whoa. Knocked my eyes out. So beautiful. He said, but her dad's got serious concerns. And you can see why. My suggestion to him was, well, Jerry, go home and open up your checkbook and your savings account and tell him about your job, your 401k, your retirement. Just show him, expose to the man, because he's concerned about the security and livelihood of his daughter. So he went to Florida and said, Dad, I understand your concern. I'm not just looking for somebody to take care of me. And he opened up everything and showed him. And his dad looked at everything and said, okay, I get it. He knew he could take care of her. He's taking care of her today. He's building her a new house. They're fixing to move in the thing. <laughs> yeah. He didn't let the fact that his body quit working from the chest down stop him. I don't care how, what kind of invalidity you got going on. There's always something you can do. You know what I have learned? What time is it? I've still got time to tell you this. When everything downturned here in 08 and people started losing jobs and churches started going out, there was one man had a church over here. Man, it was rocking and rolling, kicking and screaming. Everything was good. But there was a contractor there that had 50 people in that church employed in that, in that business. Well, when his business went under, 50 people went out of work in that church. And guess what? Well, the church finances went down. They had to move out of it. I went through that building. It was vacant. And they had this poster still on the court board on, when you walked into the church to the left and it said, look at what Christ has done for us. Imagine what he can do for you. I, read, wow. I feel sick. <laughs> it's what it said. Jimmy Mayo was with me that day. I looked at him. But do you know what? Prayer doesn't answer all problems. God's scripture don't answer all matters. And I'm a word man. In fact, I named the church the Word. But the Word doesn't answer all matters. What answers all matters? Money, money answers matters. Church on the money. I've been called that already. <laughs> I heard Leroy Thompson, that great Cajun black man down in Darrow, Louisiana, talk like he about a mouthful of peanut butter. He said, I talk about money. I'm always good. God gave me a revelation of money coming to the body of Christ. He would tell me and say, you talk too much about money. You need, you need to talk about the scripture. You need to talk, I'm not going to dominate money like you. I'm going to dominate in prayer. You need to talk about prayer. Okay, you go ahead on. You go ahead. You pray in tongues. You get up. If you get on your knees and pray in tongues, you get up. 
First thing you're going to need is some money. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said. I thought. So now, yes, who else would you like to hear from? Would you like to hear Billy Graham? No, listen. Listen. This is not a stand-up. <laughs> but I got to tell you, if you've ever listened to ministry, it's going to be funny from time to time. Listen, listen. Did you know that I don't care what kind of financial plight you're dealing with right now, I don't care what you're dealing with, the mind of the Lord is somewhere. The mind of the Lord. And you know what your job is? To find the mind of the Lord. All right, Lord, you don't leave me. You said that you'd never leave me nor forsake me. You, you said that you would supply all my needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I, obviously, if I, if I have a need, it's because I haven't seen your provision. Where is the provision? The downturn had come. The downturn had come. Every week I'd say to Janie, all right, we're praying one couple after another, one man after another. Come in my office. We'll be praying. Pray together. One pastor called me. He said, my brother-in-law just got laid off from Delta Airlines. It was the first laid off they had had in the history of the company. He said, and my sister, my sister, and they are my highest tithers. And he said, and my sister, who he's married to, collapsed in the floor of my office. And she's probably going to have a nervous breakdown. And I said, my God, Pastor, what happened? He said, they came in and said they had this corporate meeting and said, y'all, Delta Airlines is right here. If you, for this list right here, top to down to right here, if you hired in right here to this date, your 401k is still good. Your retirement's good. Your insurance is, you're vested. Your income is good. You'll have to take a 33% cut in pay. But you're okay here. If you hired in from here, previous, till, till now, you'll have to take a 64% cut in pay and you're, there's no 401k and no insurance. She said we hired in six months before that cutoff date. We have no... All the money we put in the 401k is gone. All the money we had set aside, all of our insurances, are, we don't even, we're, we're, now we're exposed we have no health insurance. Pastor looked at her and said, well, honey, welcome to my world. I hadn't had any health insurance all my life. And he said, blop, she fell on the floor. Passed out. I said, what'd you think? He said, the first thing I thought was make sure she was not, she was still breathing. Got her up. He said, I couldn't help but hear this song. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Including Delta Airlines. All other ground is sinking sand. He did it just like that. You don't realize what you're trusting until what your props get knocked out from under you. So I'd ask her every week, did you pay your house payment, pay your uh, uh, building payment? Yeah, good. Pay your utilities? No. Great. Let's go eat. Next week, did you pay your utilities? Yep. Did you pay your pastor? Not this week. Good. Let's go eat. Next week, did you pay the insurance? Yep. Did you pay your pastor? Yep. We got paid. This week. Great. Let's go eat. So in 07, a long-haired, wild, hippie-looking dude come walking in the church. I'm going to rent my basement, man. And he had cash. No, I wouldn't dare rent anything like that to him. He's a low life. And besides, you are an honorable man of God. The next month, next month, next month, when the church didn't make my house payment, his payment paid. The next month, the church didn't make the house payment, his payment Put Luke 16 up. We got two, three minutes left before I'm done. You're going to get out in time. I know it's holiday weekend. Y'all going to have fun. Luke 16, going down to, uh, is it 32? 
look at, look at verse 32. Oh, I guess it's not. You got to read, you got to read this before you go. That old boy was a master of ceremonies at a strip club. I said, what do you do down there, Wiley? He says, uh, I, they pay me to point out the obvious. I said, that's all uh, TMI already. He answered a question for me that I had had since 1982, a scripture that I'd had people tell me what they thought it meant and did not know. I'd, thank you. Thank you. Jesus said, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Verse 9. Verse 9. Jesus said, I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon, 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 mammon. What is mammon? Of unrighteousness. That when you, do you see this written in red? Who's talking? Jesus. That when you fail, when your church finances plummet, when the people lose their jobs, they, they, the friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, may receive you into everlasting habitations. Wiley and I became friends. He never did leave the strip club. Yeah, he lives in Florida now, but for five years, five and a half years he lived with me, he kept the rent. What I'm saying is we learned a way to skin the cat. We found some way to make it work. There's a way to make it work. Don't think that you're bound by just your little paycheck. Unless this is all there is. This paycheck right here is all there is. God has got another way. We just recently started renting our basement on Airbnb. People, and we've had people all respond to us the same way. Who would want to rent your basement? That's what they say. I don't know, but somebody does every weekend. Somebody's in it right now. There's folks that we pulled out this morning to come to church. We, I just waved. I said, Y'all enjoy the house. Pay me. <laughs> the house is rent in the first month it made twelve hundred dollars. First month. That'll make the house payment. What I'm saying is there's a way to skin the cat. My prayer, my winter summit that I talked about, the little prayer cabin in North Georgia hasn't cost me a dime since 2015. Almost four years now. It has not cost me a dime out of my pocket. There's a way to do all things. Now it takes work, don't it? It takes diligent effort. Believe me, there is something within your reach right now that can wonderfully bless you financially and that money will answer your issue. Raise your right hand. Lord, I say the spirit of recognition comes over the yes. people yes. and they see with eyes. You said, Rub your eyes with eye salve that they may see. Lord, give them Holy Ghost anointed eyes to see where their blessing has been sitting waiting. I know you're the need meter. I know you've already met their need. I know they need to see it and walk in it and be blessed by it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's all I got to say this morning. Yep, somebody, don't patty cake like I sunk a putt on the second hole. Spank him hands. Let me say yes, hallelujah. <laughs> you suck a putt on the second hole. <laughs> you young men, it's, it, is, it, is prepared, it is prosperous. It is, yes. That's what I'm trying to say. It is correct. It is proper that the young man bear the yoke in his youth and prepare like the ant for the winter that's coming. Then he can kick back. Then he can relax like my daddy-in-law sitting there on five acres in a half million dollar home 
watching his stock market. Thank God. You might not like Donald Trump, but he's got your economy spinning. Got your 401k back in shape. What do you want? You want somebody else in, in there so you don't have to put up with his ugly tweets? <laughs> even though you ain't got no money in the bank? Listen, this is not a political statement. Let me get up and go so I'll hush. But let me just tell you this. There's enough business wisdom in this room right here. Jay Alexander is a business wise man. Butch Pruitt is a business wise man. J.P. Salmon is a business wise man. Are you a business wise man? How many businesses do you have functioning right now? Four businesses right now. Are they all prosperous? Maybe all we need to take a little uh, lesson or two from Rick. What do you think? Amen. Amen. There's a business wise man right there. Quit a very good job, a good high paying job to go into business for himself. Is it working, son? Yes, it is. The hand of the diligent tends to plenteousness. Plus, he'll honor God with the first fruits of all of his increase. I'm not saying it because I've got an agenda because I'm a pastor. I'm just telling you, you pay a tithe of every dime you'll ever make and you'll always be prosperous. Yes, sir. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. Mr. Alexander, take that microphone and make me shut up. Amen. Uh. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Lord, I need to.